You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Hello, and welcome to episode 366 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. On September 17, 1787, the members of the Constitutional Convention concluded their work by signing the final draft of their new proposed government. The document they signed was the United States Constitution, which is why the United States marks Constitution Day each year on September 17. In honor of Constitution Day, I thought we'd explore the life of a founder who played a really large role in the creation and shaping of the United States Constitution, but he's a founder we don't hear much about, and that founder is James Wilson. Michael H. Taylor is a professor of United States history and political science at Northeast Community College in Norfolk, Nebraska. He's also the author of the book, James Wilson, The Anxious Founder. Now, if you've never heard of James Wilson, or if you've heard of him, but can't recall anything more than he was an inaugural member of the United States Supreme Court? No worries. Most people I've found have never even heard of James Wilson, which is why we'll have Michael take us through Wilson's life and his very important role in framing the United States Constitution. Now, during our exploration of Wilson's life, Michael reveals what we know about James Wilson's birth and his early life in Scotland, information about Wilson's interest in the law and why he migrated to Pennsylvania to practice law, and the important roles Wilson played in both the framing and ratification of the United States Constitution. But first, speaking of commemorative days, on October 12, 2023, the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation will honor the 250th anniversary of the founding of the public hospital. The public hospital was the first hospital in British North America devoted exclusively to treating the mentally ill. Now, we invite you to join us in person on October 12th here at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation for all of our commemorative activities. But if you can't join us in person, no worries. The Innovation Studios team and I are in the process of creating digital videos and an interactive timeline of the hospital's history so you can join us and commemorate this anniversary online. For more information about the public hospital and its history and for our online and in-person events, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash public hospital. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash public hospital. And now, allow me to introduce you to our guest historian. Joining us is a professor of United States history and political science at Northeast Community College in Norfolk, Nebraska, where he teaches courses in United States history and American government. He's also the author of James Wilson, The Anxious Founder. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Michael H. Taylor. Thank you. So, Michael, when we think of founding fathers, many of us think of men like Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, and of course, Benjamin Franklin. But one founder that we don't think of as top of mind or hear much about or maybe even know about is James Wilson. So would you tell us who James Wilson was and what inspired you to write a biography about him? Unfortunately, Wilson was one of these guys that was into a lot of different things, and he didn't leave a lot of records. And so writing the book was quite a challenge, because unlike some of the other founders you mentioned, like Washington, Jefferson, Adams, and Madison, they deliberately saved their paperwork because they're looking toward the future. It's like, I want a documentary record. Wilson didn't do that. He was too busy. There was one little thing that I found about him in the Pennsylvania newspapers that he had basically what we would consider a briefcase, that he would have documents. And there were two times when he was practicing, he left it somewhere and he had to put ads in the newspapers like, hey, if there's any money in there, you guys can keep it. I need the paperwork back. You just get this impression of somebody who's on the go trying to make his way. And part of that is he started out poor and he had big aspirations. He is the oldest son of a family in Scotland. They're about 10 miles west of St. Andrews. He had three older sisters, and his parents were very religious and desperately wanted a son to be a minister. So when he's born, 
Basically, his parents commit him to the church to be a minister. He had other ideas. He also has three younger brothers, so it's a pretty large family, but the family made sacrifices for him because they wanted him to get an education. And when he's 15, after going to some local schools, he goes to St. Andrews and applies for a scholarship. And he gets it. He studies for two years there. And he's kind of going down this path of being a minister. But the more he looks at it, the more he's like, that's not me. And then his father dies. And so you've got this large family. He has to go home. He works for a while as a tutor for a gentleman's family, teaching their kids. Then he goes back and fall of 63 until the spring of 65, right before he leaves for America. He takes some classes at the University of Glasgow. His history in this early phase before he comes to America is very murky because there's not a lot of records. There's debate about this. But it does appear that for a period of time, he's not all that happy with being a tutor. So he's looking around for other opportunities to make money. So he starts clerking for a lawyer, going through the process of being a Scottish lawyer. So he gets exposed to it in between school sessions. So he starts learning Scottish law. But the more he gets into it, the more he realizes this plays to his strengths. So he decides it's time to come to America. And part of that is because his cousin that he grew up with, Robert Anon, he owned a farm outside of Philadelphia. He was a minister. So there was this pull factor that brought him from Scotland to America. He had to basically convince his extended family, this is a good deal. Loan me some money and I'll go to America and I'll pay you guys back. So he kind of became this family project. James Wilson shows up in New York, but then goes straight to Philadelphia. The ship lands in New York in the fall of 65. And so he gets there. He's got a place to stay. He has a letter of introduction to the College of Philadelphia. And so he becomes a tutor of Latin. And apparently it's one of those things he walks in. They give him a little test. They're like, oh, my God, you could teach the class. Basically, he does. And then at the graduation ceremonies, they give him an honorary master's degree as a thank you for his work. But he didn't want to stay a tutor. So he decides, OK, I want to be an American lawyer. So he looks around and says, who's the best lawyer around? He'd like to aim high. And so he went to John Dickinson. Dickinson was expensive, but he was the gold standard. If you want to connect into the entire network in Pennsylvania, this is the guy to go study with. So he studies with him for a year and then embarks on his legal career. But that's how he gets to America. It's a little bit of he wants to get away from his mother. One of the really heart wrenching things is looking at the letters that are in the Historical Society of Pennsylvania from Wilson. And his mother's just like, Jamie, come home. She wanted him to go home. And he's like, but my career is here in America. And she's constantly concerned about you're becoming too worldly. You need to come back to your roots. And he becomes integrated in the Scottish community in Philadelphia. He becomes the president of the St. Andrews Society a couple different times. So he's active. He doesn't renounce his Scottishness. He just realizes his future is here in America. And so he gets exposed to politics with John Dickinson. It's really interesting to hear Wilson's journey to becoming a lawyer, because a lot of Scotsmen in the 18th century, when they decide that they need to go and make their way in the world, most of them turn to mercantile affairs. They become merchants. And it was really fairly common that these merchants as young men would go to America. They set up shop as factors for larger Scottish merchant firms. And then after a period of time, when they had learned the business, many of them ended up migrating back to Scotland, where they helped take over the mercantile firm they were working for or even started their own firm. So it does seem a bit odd that there is this more typical path for Scotsmen to come to America, namely to learn the mercantile trade. But in the case of James Wilson, he's specifically looking at a move to America as a path to him being able to become a lawyer. Yes, that's actually in chapter two of the book. I had to cover that because that was one of the questions I had. I'm like, he doesn't fit. He's in a very tiny percentage of Scotsmen who come over who aren't involved in other trades. Lawyers were one of the least likely to move to America. From my research, I just think a lot of it is he wanted to be out on his own. He saw that he did have a connection with his cousin in Philadelphia, that it wasn't a total break with Scotland. 
And from what survives, Robert Anand and him were as close as brothers. So in a sense, it was safe for him to come to Philadelphia. And once he got a taste for it and realized, wow, this is a pretty cool place. Because you got to remember, Philadelphia at that time was the publishing capital of America. It was, for a person who had an education, Philadelphia was the place to be. And he fit right in. Now, Wilson's legal training also sounds a bit curious in that he had started reading law and studying law while he was in Scotland. As you said, he went to the University of Glasgow to take classes. And in between those classes, he's clerking for a Scottish lawyer. How did Wilson's study of Scottish law prepare him to study for American law? And how did his exposure to Scottish law impact his interpretation of American law? Well, that's one of the murky areas in the research. We know he studied with lawyer William Robertson in Scotland. We know that because Wilson's signature shows up in some of the paperwork for Robertson's office. And at one point, Robertson becomes a clerk. And Wilson basically is the guy who's writing everything out. So did he have an opportunity to practice the law? No. He saw how it worked behind the scenes. You know, the drudgery part of here's how the forms are. This is how you argue. You combine that with his classes at Glasgow, and he's got this Scottish Enlightenment background. So he has the skills to do it. He just hasn't been able to practice it. And he realized that there wasn't much of an opportunity for him to do that in Scotland. He realized that going with Dickinson, there was that whole network that would open up for him. And Dickinson would train him to be an American lawyer. He was starting down the path in Scotland. Now, James Wilson arrived in Philadelphia in the fall of 1765. And if we think about that period, the summer and fall of 1765 is when the Stamp Act crisis is taking place. So Boston is rioting over the Stamp Act. You can see a lot of protest happening in newspapers. Philadelphia is a part of this. Michael, did you ever get a sense of what Wilson's impressions of this budding revolution were? Yeah, that was something I was really interested in when I started researching him. Because he doesn't leave any records other than the letters back to Scotland, and he doesn't talk about American politics at all. He gets this job at the College of Philadelphia, and so he's in this academic realm, and he starts making connections with what we would term the local elite. So he would definitely have been aware of it. But unlike Tom Paine, who just kind of jumps into it and becomes active, Wilson, in this sense, you could call him conservative in the sense that he steps back realizes he wants a career, and he takes time to think about consequences. I have no doubt with him being in his law office, he would have seen Dickinson working on things, been aware of Dickinson's attitude. They probably had conversations. Unfortunately, so much of these things, like with his relationship with James Madison, their best activity was when they were in the same room. So they're not writing to each other. I don't have that lovely conversation like between Madison and Jefferson in the letters because they were in the same room. And a lot of the stuff with Dickinson's the same way. He starts with Dickinson in 1766, ends in 1767. It appears that it's not until 1768 that he really starts thinking about things. James Wilson is now able to be a lawyer and realizes there's too many of us in Philadelphia. I got to move. So he moves to Reading, Pennsylvania, sets up shop. Reading at that time is the frontier. So there's not a lot of activity. There's not a lot of things going on. And so he starts thinking about two things. One, he and his friend William White, they start a series in the newspapers. That's part of 1760. That's the first half. The second half, because he's on the frontier, he starts thinking, how do we relate back to the Imperial Center in London? What's our role? What's our relationship? And he starts writing a research project. He's one of these guys who loves to have a long title. So he writes what he names the considerations on the nature and extent of the legislative authority of the British Parliament. Basically, he determines that they really don't have any authority over us internally. So he's backing up the arguments put forth by Dickinson. But whereas Dickinson kind of sees a middle road, Wilson doesn't. So in essence, Wilson's arguing for what becomes the British Commonwealth later. But that's kind of where he goes. So in 1768, this is way in advance of people 
like Jefferson that write almost the same thing in 1774. Wilson wants to publish it. And his friends in Philadelphia are like, oh, how much do you want to have a career in the law? If you go public with this, with your name on it, you might get blacklisted. This could be bad. So why don't you shelve it for a while? And you get the impression that he really wanted to publish it, but he deferred to friends at the College of Philadelphia. But by 1774, it's another one of a series of things that were published that year. And so it didn't stand out. So that's why I take a lot of time in the book to say, no, you need to judge it against when it was written in 68. What were his arguments then? But we don't know about him for six years because in the end, he chose career over publishing. I call 1768 his productive year in the sense that he writes the most in 1768. He really thinks about life. That part he covers with William White in The Visitant. He meets William White, who's a student at the College of Philadelphia when he's a tutor. And White wants to become a minister. And somehow they strike up a conversation. They become lifelong friends. So when Wilson becomes a lawyer and moves, they keep in touch by writing because writing is about 50 miles from Philadelphia. And so they write back and forth and they get this idea. Hey, let's write a series for the newspapers. And they chose the pseudonym of The Visitant. Basically, somebody who comments on the world is not a part of, but can stand up above it and comment. And they started out with this high tone of, let's see how society ticks. And so Wilson writes all the odd numbered ones. White writes all the even numbered ones, except an exception on history that Wilson writes. These are two young guys in their 20s, and it quickly devolves into women. It's like, how do we get a wife? How do we figure out women and our careers? People don't know it's them. But they both wrote well. It shows up in the papers in the Pennsylvania Chronicle from February 1st, 1768. And it runs for 16 straight weeks. And they are presented front page right under the masthead. And the interesting thing is, I call it a virtual salon because people start writing in and commenting. And then they publish that. And then they respond to it. And then readers start commenting to each other with them kind of stepping back and commenting on it. It's funny because at one point, people were like, who are the authors? They think it's Dickinson. People are like, no, this is a little too racy for Dickinson. And they name some other people. They never do figure it out until years later. While James Wilson certainly formed his own ideas about the American Revolution, it does sound like John Dickinson and studying in his law office played a significant role in at least introducing James Wilson to the ideas of the American Revolution. So I wonder if we could talk about Dickinson for a moment. As you said, he's a really well-known and respected Philadelphia lawyer. He's an astute politician who's serving in all these different offices in the Pennsylvania government. And he's a talented writer who would later become known as the penman of the revolution. But Michael, in your book, James Wilson, the Anxious Founder, you state that Dickinson, yes, he had a large influence on James Wilson's life, but he also cast a pretty big shadow over it. So would you tell us more about the relationship between James Wilson and John Dickinson? Well, interestingly, the first time I encountered these two was in the movie version of 1776. And unfortunately, they do Wilson wrong. Dickinson shows up with Wilson and Caesar Rodney introduces them to Lyman Hall of Georgia before they go into what becomes Independence Hall. And... Dickinson gets introduced. He walks off. Wilson's standing there to get introduced. And Rodney's like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you there because you're in the shadow of Mr. Dickinson. And so they made a little quip about it in 1776. I'm like, okay, how accurate was that? And really, it is up until Dickinson was the leader of the Pennsylvania delegation at the Second Continental Congress. Dickinson was against the Declaration of Independence because of all the founders, he had the most thorough education in the English law. So he'd spent time at the ends of court and he's like, there's no way we can win a revolution. None. He's like, we'll lose everything. And Wilson had deferred to his judgment at the Second Continental Congress. But as time went on, Wilson thought more and more that we should be independent. But he deferred to Dickinson. And part of that was, this is one of the interesting things that usually doesn't come up, In the Pennsylvania legislature, Dickinson had written the instructions 
to the Pennsylvania delegation not to vote for independence. So Dickinson gave himself orders not to vote for independence. And Wilson considered that binding from the Pennsylvania legislature. And so until they changed their mind on independence, he kept voting no. Once Pennsylvania freed their delegates to vote for it, then he became the deciding vote when the final vote was taken on July 2nd for independence. Dickinson, they arranged for him not to be there because Dickinson's like, I would vote against it if I'm there. I'm just not going to be there to split the Pennsylvania delegation. I tell the story of the Constitutional Convention in this conflict between Dickinson and Wilson because you get this interesting dynamic. One's your mentor and one's the student. And yet at the convention, they're equals because Dickinson at that point is representing Delaware. So in the first part of the convention, they're on opposite sides. And then toward the end, they become allies because Dickinson gets some of the things he wants in the Constitution. And then he realizes this is good for Delaware. This is good for the country. And after it, to the point that Dickinson, he's approached to establish Dickinson College. And so Wilson actually is the lawyer who draws up the Articles of Incorporation for the college, and he's on their board of directors for a while. So there's this interesting relationship that they have throughout their lives. Even though there's this huge break over independence, it doesn't destroy their friendship. Yeah, John Dickinson pretty famously abstained from that vote for independence. In fact, he even kept himself from attending the Continental Congress when it voted for independence on July 2nd, 1776. Now, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about James Wilson's role in this vote for independence and perhaps about the wider role he played in the Second Continental Congress. Was this just a time in his life when he was always associated with Dickinson and therefore overshadowed by Dickinson's unwillingness to vote for independence? Well, one of the interesting things I found was that there was pressure throughout that spring and early summer of 1776 by pro-revolutionary forces in Pennsylvania for Pennsylvania to come forward and vote for independence. And Wilson starts getting uncomfortable with the flack he was getting. It's like the pressure to change in favor of independence. And he felt bound by those instructions from the legislature. So he was working behind the scenes. It's like, please change our instructions so I can vote for this. And this is where he starts spreading away from Dickinson. It gets to a point that looking toward his future political career, he gets a resolution adopted by the Second Continental Congress, signed by virtually every pro-independence person there, including people like Jefferson and a bunch of others. It's a testimonial, in essence, that the Second Continental Congress is like, he's really for independence. He just can't vote for it because of this reason. Don't hold this against him. It's a really strange document that's in the archives. And so if I remember right, this document comes out in May, mid to late May. So it's before they start debating independence itself. But he feels the need to have some cover for not having already switched his vote. At this point in time, we need to fast forward a bit and go from the summer of 1776 and the Second Continental Congress to the Constitutional Convention in fall 1787. Because this is where we can see James Wilson really come into his own as a politician and as someone who played a really important role in shaping the United States Constitution. But just before we jump forward in time, let's take a moment to thank our episode sponsor. It's September, and your busy fall season is already in full swing. So you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals to help you with your jam-packed days. Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit, can help you fuel up fast with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, eat well, and stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Eating well when you're on the go can be difficult. With Factor, you can skip the extra trip to the grocery store and save time with the chopping, prepping, and cleanup too, while still getting the flavor and nutritional quality you want in high-quality meals. Factor's fresh, never-frozen meals are ready in just two minutes. All you have to do is heat up your meal and enjoy leaving you extra time to get back to your busy fall schedule. Factor allows you to choose from more than 34 flavor-packed, fresh, never-frozen meals each week, and all of its meals are ready to eat in just two minutes. Factor also has different meal options for different lifestyles and moods. Level up with Gourmet Plus options. Upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini, leeks, truffle butter, and asparagus 
prepared to perfection by Factor Chefs. If you're like me, you may be looking for some healthy and quick lunch options. Factor has you covered with ready-to-eat wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers that are ready to eat without even a microwave when you're on the go or can't get away from your desk. And if you're looking for calorie-conscious options, try Factor's delicious, dietitian approved calorie-smart meals that have just around 550 calories per serving or less. This September, get Factor and enjoy eating well without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered right to your door. Ready in just two minutes, no prep, no mess. Head to factor.com slash benfranklin50 and use code benfranklin50 to get 50% off. That's code benfranklin50 at factormeals.com slash benfranklin50 to get 50% off. In 1787, the state of Pennsylvania sent James Wilson to the Constitutional Convention. And while officially the convention was called to amend the Articles of Confederation, we know that some delegates went to the Constitutional Convention with the specific intention to devise a new system of government. Michael, what was James Wilson's mindset going into the Constitutional Convention? Did he go to amend the Articles of Confederation or did he also attend the convention with the idea that, no, this new nation needs to create an entirely new government? He's probably the leading figure who comes to the convention and says, wait a minute, we got selected to recommend, not amend. We can recommend anything, but legally, that means nothing. We are here to provide our best advice to the American people. And then they get to decide whether what we did was a good thing or not. So he firmly from day one was like, we're not here to amend. We're here to create something new. And part of that is before the convention starts, the first delegation to show up is Virginia. And of course, the Pennsylvanians, they all lived in Philadelphia. The two sides start having dinner together to plot strategy. So Madison actually shows a copy of the Virginia plan to the Pennsylvanians, and they start thinking about, okay, we support this, and they start strategizing. There's even a famous dinner the night before the convention starts at Ben Franklin's house. And it's like, okay, tomorrow we get started on this. And that's one of the things. You've got Governor Morris, you've got Wilson. Franklin doesn't have that big of a role at the convention. So it's really Morris and Wilson with the Virginians. and. They both believed from the get-go, we need to come up with something new. And Dickinson, when he shows up, he's got skin in the game because he wrote a good chunk of the Articles of Confederation. So it's like, wait a minute, Roger Sherman, same way. He's like, we know it was the best we could do at the time. And they both ultimately realized throughout the summer, yeah, it needs changed. Dickinson really wanted to just amend the Articles, but Wilson and what has become known as the nationalists were like, nope, we got to start over. And also, you also have to keep this in the background when you look at the convention. The Articles of Confederation, you had to have all 13 states say yes to change it. It never happened during the life of the Articles. And they realized if we have this approved by the state legislatures, good odds are at least one would say no and it wouldn't go into effect. So there's this debate of how many states should we have before it becomes active? And even some people still argue, oh, well, you know, the Articles of Confederation never really went out of existence. It's not like we ever said, okay, it's done. We just replaced it with the Constitution and then they ignored it. Wilson definitely was in that camp from day one of, we got to start over. Let's give the country our best judgment. There should be no restrictions on what we talk about. And he definitely was in the camp where we're not going to publish. We need secrecy. Jefferson sitting in Paris is like, this is horrible. And Wilson's like, no, if we publish everything, you're going to start playing to the media and we won't get the best product. My students today are like, there's no way you could get away with that. It'd be on C-SPAN. Everybody would be tweeting during the commenting. You couldn't have a similar debate today because it would all be public because everybody, even then, they were like, what are they talking about? Are we going to have a king? Or are they going to bring that back? Nobody knew. And so there was this wild speculation in the press. But Wilson and the others were like, let's give it our best shot on what we think can save us and let the public decide. Yes, no, 
One of the really interesting aspects of Michael's book, James Wilson, The Anxious Founder, is that Michael doesn't just investigate the Constitutional Convention of 1787. He actually investigates that convention through the eyes of the delegates like James Wilson, who were born outside of the 13 British North American colonies. Michael, this is such an interesting perspective. As we try to understand Wilson's importance at the Constitutional Convention and his contributions, would you tell us more about his perspective on the convention, being that he was born in Scotland and not in the 13 British North American colonies? I just thought about those people who were born and educated outside of the country and then also compared that to those Americans who studied abroad in England. There wasn't as much of a correlation there as I thought there might be. But for those people who were born and educated outside of the country, one of the things that stands out is that they had a much closer attachment to the nation, the concept of America. Like Wilson, he wasn't born in Pennsylvania. So he lived in Pennsylvania, but his identity was Scotland. So from the beginning, one of the things that brings these people together is they were much more willing to discuss the idea of a nation, of a national government. And so they had a much broader perspective. And other authors have gone down that route of talking about how participation in the Continental Army brought a continental perspective. And you can see that at the convention, too. Biggest example is Hamilton, who comes up with arguably one of the craziest ideas of a president for life, Senate for life. He was going full bore in that direction. But there is a common thread. These people wanted a stronger executive than a lot of the members of the convention. And that's one of the things Madison thought a lot about the legislature, but there's a lot of blanks <laughs> in the executive part of the Virginia plan. He didn't have experience in the executive. Wilson didn't either, but he had ideas. So in many instances in the debates, Madison would back Wilson up. And it's interesting to see during different parts of the debates where one will take the lead on talking about the Virginia plan, and the other one will support. And when you get to the executive, Madison really plays a secondary role compared to Wilson, because Wilson is the guy who stands up and says, I want a single executive. But you had people like Edmund Randolph, the governor of Virginia, he wanted three people to be president. And Wilson's like, if you have one person, you know who to blame when things go bad, and then you can vote against them the next time. So there's that. And he's also responsible for the Electoral College. He pushes that early on. The delegates don't like it. Virginia's George Mason famously said, letting the public choose the president is like a blind man selecting a coat of many colors. A nice way of saying the public has no business choosing the president. And that's one of the things people sometimes get surprised about when they look at the convention is there aren't really many Democrats, what we would call people of a Democratic mindset. For example, one of the things that sets Wilson apart is he wanted senators to be elected by the public. And he had an interesting take on this, too. And this happens in some states where members to the state Senate are elected across county boundaries. Well, Wilson wanted the U.S. Senate to be, OK, pick a number, whatever it was going to be, and divide the country up into equal senatorial districts. So senators would represent different chunks of people compared to those in states. You could go across state boundaries. That would be a very different Senate than what we've seen. But, of course, his colleagues were like, yeah, dumb idea. We want the state legislatures involved. We want them selecting the senators. So arguably, Wilson's the most Democratic-minded person at the convention, which is funny because some people think of him as this Federalist who just look down on the average person. But when you actually start looking at what he said, it's quite striking for its time. And in addition to being a leader at the Constitutional Convention and trying to get people to think of the nation rather than just restrict their thoughts to their region and their individual states, after the Constitutional Convention, James Wilson played a prominent role in defending the Constitution. He gave an important speech that you talk about in your book called the State House Yard Speech, which he gave on October 6th. 1787. Would you tell us about that speech, Michael, and why Wilson acted to defend the Constitution really right on the heels of the end of the Constitutional Convention? What happened is after the Constitution gets sent to Congress and then they send it out to the states, 
the states then have to figure out a way to hold a ratification convention. So on October 6th, there was a meeting at the state house outside where they were putting forth a slate of candidates for the ratification convention that was going to meet the next month in November. So supporters had started seeing negative critiques of the Constitution showing up in the Pennsylvania press. And since you're going to be electing delegates to vote for or against the Constitution, it was felt somebody needed to go public and they picked Wilson. So apparently it's one of these things. Normally what happened at that time, people would use a pseudonym. That's why, you know, the Federalist Papers is Publius, not James Madison, John Jay, Alexander Hamilton. The idea was authors wanted people to engage with their ideas and not automatically say, well, I hate that guy. I'm not going to read his stuff. Well, Wilson has the, if you want to call it the distinction of being the first member of the convention to go public in defense of the Constitution. So in the debates from that point on, he's the number one Federalist, anti-Federalist love to hate and pick on. He was a logical choice for this. And he had to know, given the Philadelphia press, because they printed the whole thing within a couple of days. And it got reprinted more throughout the states than any other item in the debates, even more than the Federalist Papers. So if there is a version of the Constitution that the reading public was familiar with, it was what Wilson said that day. And then constantly throughout the debates, people were referring back to this. Even at one point, Jefferson reads it in Paris and he comments to Madison. He's like, well, you know, I got problems with some of what he said. And here's why. Because Wilson took the position like Madison, a lot of the others, you didn't need a federal bill of rights because almost all the states already had one. So they didn't think it was an issue. Yeah, Wilson goes out. They win the election. Two thirds of all the delegates to the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention are pledged to vote for the Constitution. So they could have voted the very first day. I think Georgia spent like four hours <laughs> before they voted yes. I mean, they weren't even there a whole day. And Pennsylvania could have done that. But as the leader of the pro-ratification forces, he realized what we say here is going to get reprinted. So let's go through the Constitution. Let's lay forth our arguments. They're going to get reprinted. This can be research for our allies in other states of how we defended it. And also, what is the other side saying? Actually, that's the focus of the book I'm currently working on is the ratification period the first comments on the Constitution show up before they even adjourn. They start showing up in August 1787. So I carry that story all the way through until July 4th, 1788, because they have a celebration. The Constitution's approved. And also James Wilson is the keynote speaker. So it, it's a nice way to end the book. Here's Wilson's high moment. It's all downhill from there. The last 10 years of his life are not that happy. Would you tell us more about Wilson's life after the Constitutional Convention? Because you said there are a lot of lowlights there, but he does become one of the first associate justices of the United States Supreme Court. He does. You know, in the background, you also have to keep in mind that he has issues with paying his bills. He's a successful lawyer. He's making money, but he's also into land speculation. And the last 10 years is a big problem for him. So he helps get the Constitution ratified. The elections are held and the government starts operating in the spring of 89. and he gets anxious. He wants a federal job. He makes a huge mistake. He writes a letter, a very short letter, to George Washington after Washington had been elected president and basically says, Mr. President, I don't want you to have an embarrassment of someone saying no. So I'm going to say yes right now to being the chief justice of the Supreme Court. That's what he wanted. The letter, it's one tiny paragraph that Washington sends back. The first time I read it, a chill ran down my spine because you're just like, oh, you made the guy mad. And he just slaps him down and basically says, they selected me for who I am. How dare you ask me for this job? There's people lobbying. Benjamin Rush is writing to John Adams. It's like, hey, can you say a good word for my buddy Wilson here? And Wilson, his finances, people are starting to talk about it in Philadelphia and New York. and Washington being a very good politician, here's this. He knows he doesn't want to be embarrassed by Wilson possibly going bankrupt while being the chief justice of the Supreme Court. 
So he's more than willing to put him on the court as an associate justice. So he's the first associate justice nominated. But John Jay gets the chief justice. And then later, when Jay resigns to become governor of New York, Wilson, again, hey, I'm available, but his finances are even in a worse shape. And so he gets passed over again. And one of the first people to come onto the court is James Iredale of North Carolina. And they become close friends, which is interesting because Iredale comes from an established English family. His family splits over the revolution. But he and Wilson, they became very close. Their wives became very close. So one of the things that Congress made them do that they didn't like was they had to ride circuit. There was a northern circuit. There was a middle section circuit and the south. The south circuit was horrible. It had the most miles. It was through the worst territory. And Wilson, he has to stay in the court to stay afloat financially. So the longer he's on the court, the more the job becomes necessary. He needs to keep it. That's why he keeps trying to get chief justice because there's a pay hike. But that doesn't happen because people are concerned that he's going to go bankrupt. Ultimately, what happens is he's imprisoned while he's riding circuit for debt in New Jersey. His son, Bird Wilson, is able to get enough money together to bail him out. And then he goes on the run to North Carolina and James Iredale helps him hide out for a while. But while he's there, he unfortunately gets malaria and dies. When you take a look at his legacy, because he dies during the quasi-war crisis with France, and his papers aren't collected, he kind of dies in disgrace. There's actually a move in the U.S. Senate to impeach him for debt. And they were just starting to talk about when he dies. And so when Iredale sends a letter to the administration of John Adams and says, hey, we need to replace Wilson because he just died. And they're like, oh, thank God. Wilson would have been, in all likelihood, the first justice of the Supreme Court to go through impeachment. They thought at the time debt was worthy of impeachment. There's like a symmetry to this because the person who gets nominated to replace Wilson is Washington's nephew, Bushrod. And Washington recognized Wilson's statue as a lawyer. And Washington, just like Wilson had trained with Dickinson, arranged for Wilson to train Bushrod. So his own law student replaces him on the Supreme Court when he dies. And Bushrod Washington is on the court for almost three decades. So that's why the second book is going to end on the high note with him being the focus of attention on July 4th, 1788, because once he gets on the Supreme Court, he's frustrated. There's not a lot to do other than right circuit, which interferes with him trying to save his financial empire. And there's this really strange split in his personality of there's this political thinker. And on the other side, there's this poor kid from Scotland who wants to be rich. And those two things don't always go together. In the last two years of his life, he comes up with this grand scheme to create a path for immigrants from Europe to come to America. Basically, they were trying to form a company where immigrants would get paid to come over on ships owned by the company. There would be rest stops along the way. And when they got on the frontier, there would already be a cabin built and a crop in the field. Of course, you know, the investors would get a cut all the way along the line. So unlike how he got here, pooling the family resources, it was let's provide a safe, comfortable way to get from Europe to America, and you pay us to do it. So he was shopping this around before he died. The financing was insane. Americans didn't have the money to set up this vast apparatus. So he was going to have to ask Europeans, and it never happened, of course. But even at the end of his life, he keeps thinking big. And so there's the political realm and then there's the economic realm that he's just an abject failure. Michael, when you think of James Wilson and his legacy, what do you come up with? What do you think the legacy of James Wilson is? He's definitely not among the first tier of the founders, but he definitely deserves to be in that second tier of people who had impact on the Constitution. Because, you know, when he gets to the Supreme Court, there's just not that much to do. So it's that period of time from getting to the Constitutional Convention 
to ratification. That is when he does the United States his best service. And now it's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. So, Michael, in your opinion, what would the Constitution of the United States look like today if James Wilson had never left Scotland and had never become involved in the American Revolution or the establishment of the United States' government? My take on that would be that the Constitution would look a lot more like the Articles of Confederation, that we would have much more of a parliamentary type of government. The executive would be much more constrained and less powerful than what evolved. It's interesting. He kind of saw what was possible for the future and tried to get that into the Constitution. But yeah, there's no doubt that as a document, the Constitution would look a lot different. And by the way, he's also responsible for the treason clause because he was familiar with how English kings had just said, you committed treason to get rid of people. Not a lot of evidence, just the charge and they'd get executed. And so that's why very few people in American history have been convicted of treason. Because there's only two ways. You either testify in open court, you did it, which no one ever has. And the other way is you had to have two witnesses to the act of treason. It's also possible that the three-fifths clause wouldn't be in the Constitution. It had been adopted in the Confederation Congress. And Wilson had a good relationship with some of the South Carolina and North Carolina delegates. And so he said, hey, wait a minute, we've already done this in the Confederation Congress. Why don't we put this in the Constitution? Because it would be easier to be adopted coming from a Pennsylvanian than, say, from a South Carolinian, like John Rutledge. There's actually very little debate at the Constitutional Convention on the Three-Fifths Compromise. But Wilson's the one who proposes it and says, hey, we've already done this. Can't we just use that? And they say yes. So maybe that's not in the Constitution either. And who knows what the ramifications of that would have been, because slavery was one of those fault lines at the convention that they kind of papered over, and the Three-Fifths Compromise was a big part of that. Over the course of our conversation, you've teased your next book project for us, Michael, and I wonder if you would now share a few more details about the new book you're working on. There were a lot of things I couldn't talk about in the Wilson book because it would have made it 500 pages. Because one of the fascinating things I wanted to look at was Wilson's role in the ratification in Pennsylvania, since Pennsylvania was the publishing industry of the country. And what was said in Philadelphia got spread everywhere. And he's the leader of the Federalists. So there's like this virtual ratification debate going on. Pennsylvania's the first large state to say yes. Pennsylvania is important. A lot of these arguments that you hear later get first used in Pennsylvania. And so that's why this new book is going to start in roughly August when articles start appearing in the Pennsylvania press for and against. They don't even know what the Constitutional Convention is doing yet, but people are already kind of taking sides. And then there's actually a riot after Pennsylvania approves in Carlisle. And Pennsylvania is the only state that actually tries to decertify their ratification. And so there's all these things that are unique to Pennsylvania. And I wanted to tie that all together, companion piece to the book on Wilson, but it's more of a what's happening in Pennsylvania at the time. And Wilson's one of the major figures. And so that's what the new book's about. And it's supposed to come out in the summer of 2025. And where is the best place to look for more information about you and how we can contact you with questions? My contact information is on uh, the Northeast Community College website. And so they can get my email there. And I've also got a page on Amazon. They can also get a hold of me through that. Michael H. Taylor, thank you for introducing us to James Wilson and its important contributions to the United States Constitution. Thank you. As we acknowledged, James Wilson is not a founder many Americans are familiar with. And part of the reason we don't think of James Wilson is because he didn't leave us many of his personal papers, thoughts, or records to remember him by. As Michael told us, James Wilson seemed to be a founder who was always on the go. Born into a Scottish family that didn't have a lot of money to spare, 
Wilson learned from an early age that he had to work hard at both his studies and his work in order to support himself and build a better life. So while other founders had enough resources to support the time that they spent theorizing and philosophizing about rights and government, and then writing books, pamphlets, and other tracts about those ideas, Wilson did not. He had to spend his time working at the law and serving clients to make his ends meet. Wilson was also not a founder who lived into old age and then found the time later in his life to organize his papers for posterity. As Michael mentioned, Wilson died of malaria at the age of 55. But where Wilson didn't leave much of a mark in our archives, he did leave an indelible mark on our Constitution. James Wilson's experience and worldview as a Scotsman shaped his view that the new government of the United States ought to have a national framework, a framework that included one chief executive elected not directly by the people, but by an electoral college. Wilson also played a key role in adding the highly contested three-fifths clause to the Constitution. That's the clause that outlined that each enslaved person would only count as three-fifths of a whole person to determine congressional representation. Plus, Wilson also added the treason clause to the Constitution. Now, one aspect of Wilson's participation in the Constitutional Convention that we did not get to discuss with Michael was Wilson's membership on the Convention's Committee of Detail. After working out the many compromises and ideas the convention delegates wanted to see in their new proposed government, it was up to Wilson, Edmund Randolph, John Rutledge, Oliver Ellsworth, and Nathaniel Gorham to actually write up all of those ideas and compromises and put them down on paper. It was as a member of this drafting committee that Wilson was able to add elements to the Constitution, like the Necessary and Proper Clause, that allows the United States Congress some leeway to operate in the national interest. Plus, Wilson added other elements to ensure that the federal government would always support national supremacy over the power of the states, which is exactly the opposite of the power structure that had developed under the Articles of Confederation. Under the Articles of Confederation, the states always had more power than the national government. So regardless of whether you had ever heard of him before today, James Wilson was an important founder of the United States, given his leadership role in debating, drafting, and defending the United States Constitution. The Constitution that, along with its 27 amendments, still structures the United States government today. You'll find more information about Michael, his book, James Wilson, the Anxious Founder, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page. BenFranklinsWorld.com slash 366. Knowing how your Constitution and government works is an important part of being a good citizen. So please be a good United States citizen and share this episode of Ben Franklin's World with a friend or family member you think should hear it. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Joseph Edelman, Katie Schinebeck, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, over the years, we've covered the history and origins of the judicial, executive, and congressional branches of the United States government. Now, we haven't covered every facet of history associated with those branches, so what I'd like to know is what more about those operations and origins would you like to know about? Tell me, Liz at BenFranklinsWorld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. <laughs>